Good morning, Believers Fellowship. I hope y'all are having a great first morning at the marriage retreat. I know y'all are going to have a great day. And uh, I have a lot of material to cover this morning. And I'm going to be talking about the 10 steps to training your child in a technological world. I hope you've uh, had your coffee this morning. I've had my monster and I'm ready to dive in. But I do want to let you know we may not get through all 10 of these points. Um, they are in your workbook because I want to make sure that I have enough time to share with you the advice and the tips and all the different techniques that you can use to make sure that you protect and guard the mind of your child and secure your home from the attack of Satan coming in to destroy you, your life, your marriage, and your children. But before we get started, I think we have to start with basically some foundational principles that we have to look at in our own lives. The first one is this. I believe we need to focus on being the man of God, the women of God, before doing the work of God. Psalms 24, 3-4 says, Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? And who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood and has not sworn deceitfully. You see, there's no parenting book. There's no idea. There's no seminar that you can take that can compete with God's power that works in you and through you when you come to the altar with clean hands and a pure heart. I think, first off, we need to be real, holding ourselves to the same standard that we hold our children, that we admit our failures. I know there's adults in this room that are sitting here thinking to yourselves, I don't have any kids, so this really doesn't apply for me. And you're just going to tune me out, but I want to give you a, a warning, because I believe the material I'm sharing with you today can be an accountability, a great accountability in your relationship with your wife, in your relationship with your husband. The second thing I believe we need to do is submit our abilities and our weakness to God and allow His power to work through who we are. 2 Corinthians 13.4 says, For we also are weak in Him, yet we live with Him because of the power of God directed towards us. You see, trying to do something in our own power always leads to self-doubt. And it may cause you to mentally and spiritually give up. Don't make excuses for your children. Don't make excuses for your sin and the relationship of your marriage. And never, ever give up. The third thing I believe that we need to do is develop a plan that fulfills God's purpose. Psalms 127, 4-5 shows us what His purpose is. He says, Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. How blessed is a man whose quiver is full of them. Have you ever wondered why he relates or associates arrows with our children? I believe it's because it was the most precision weapon of the day. It was accurate. It was a long distance. It was the only long distance weapon. It was effective. It was the weapon of choice. But not only that, it took hard work to fashion those arrows. We've talked about that in our raising our children. It takes a lot of work. But not only that, we see in Isaiah 49, verses 1 and 2, it says, The Lord called me from the womb for the body of my mother. He named me. He has made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of His hand, He has concealed me. And He has made me a select arrow. And He has hidden me in His quiver. I want you to understand today, guys, that your child, your children are on loan to you. They are temporarily placed in your quiver to one day become his select arrow, just as Isaiah, hidden in his quiver. I love what Brother Joe says about the difference between training versus raising. He says you train, you raise corn, but you train warriors. We need to be training warriors. We need to be training them as the select arrows that are going to be hidden in God's quiver. That he's going to be able to take them and launch them off into the world to fulfill his plan, his purpose. It's going to start with us. We're going to have to set an example for our children. It starts with you. Whether you believe it or not, they are watching you. 1 Corinthians 11.1 1 says, Be imitators of me just as I am of Christ. We should be able to say the same things to our children. Watch me, because I'm going on with Christ. 
follow me because he is my everything. What is our responsibility? We're going to look at that in a few moments, the 10 steps to training your child. But I believe that most of it is found right here in Proverbs 22, verse 6. It says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and even when he is old, he will not depart from it. You know, train up your child in the way he should go should, would rather be translated, it's, be, it's, it's best translated, the way he is bent. That's a better translation. Don't raise your children based on how others raise theirs. Of course, there's biblical and principles that we all need to follow, but we need to be on our face before God on behalf of our children, day in and day out. There's nothing wrong with getting advice, but nothing works the same on every child. And raising children is a challenge. It's your responsibility to get direction from God. Never compare your children to somebody else's. Never dictate to another parent how to raise their children. It's okay to point out truth. It's okay to hold others accountable to the Word of God or to even offer advice. But God's given the authority to raising the children to the parent, not to the church, and definitely not the village or the community as the government would like to propose. So let's go on. What are those ten steps of training your child in a technological world? I believe the first one is this. Remove what doesn't look like Jesus. Now I know you're thinking, you know, that's basic, Tim. That's so basic. But I believe it is the basic foundation principle that we need to adhere to in raising our children. Hebrews 4.11 says, The Word of God is quick and it's powerful and it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder the soul and the spirit and the joints and marrow, and it is a discerner of the thoughts and the intent of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is manifest in its sight, but listen, all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him whom we have to do. I believe it's utmost importance, and it is simplistic, to apply the word of God to the lives of our children daily. Which leads us to the next thing. We need to teach them diligently. Diligently, not just, not just on occasion, but diligently. John, I mean, 3 John, verse 1, verse 4, says, I have no greater joy than this, to hear my children walk in what? Truth. If we want them to walk in truth, we're going to have to teach them diligently. Um, we're going to have to bind truth to their frontals. I didn't know what the word frontals meant, but I want to read this passage of Scripture in Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. It is a great passage, but I'm only going to start at verse 7. It says, You shall teach them diligently to your sons, and shall talk to them when you sit in your house, when you walk in your way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as signs on your hands, and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. I looked up what this, what this meant. It's referring to two plates that are on the front of our skull that are right here on either side of our eyes. And we're supposed to place truth right here like blinders on a horse so there is no distraction from the things of the world that are going around us that we're so focused on truth that we can only please God. We're going to have to bind truth around their neck. You know, what is it that you value? You know, what do you place? What is it? What is a, when we wear a necklace, what is it? We place something on there that we value, whether it's a pendant, a picture of our kids, a cross. We value it. It says in, in, in Proverbs 3, 3 through 6, I'm not going to read the passage. It's there for you if you'd like to. But it says that we need to place value on them, and it'll make your path straight. Bind truth around your neck. The next one is, is uh, found in Proverbs 6, 22, 20 through 22. It says, basically, the next step is bind them to your heart, is what this passage of Scripture says. What is it that you bind to your heart? Is that what you love? Because it's going to guide you. It's going to watch over you. It's going to talk to you, is what this passage says. The next thing I believe we need to do is teach them basic traits of Christian character. In Galatians, we need to teach them the fruit of the Spirit, which the last one is self-control. 
That's the biggest thing we need to be teaching our kids in this technological world is to be controlled, to control themselves. Philippians 4.8 says, Finally, brethren, whatever is true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, of good repute, excellent, worthy of praise, dwell on these things. We need to teach our children what to dwell on, what is worthy of praise. In 1 Corinthians 13, 4, 8, it says, we need to teach them what love is. You know this passage. We need to teach them what love is so that they will be able to identify the counterfeit. We need to teach them to recognize a counterfeit. You know, I love what Brother Joe said when his son went to work for the bank. He said, you know, they taught him how to, how to identify and recognize a counterfeit by having him study what the real thing looks like. We don't need to study the counterfeit. We don't need to go study these things, but we need to teach them truth. We need to teach them what the real thing looks like. We need to teach them what God's plan, what God's purpose is for their lives. The third thing we need to do is raise the standard. Amos 7, 7, 9 says that... Uh, Thus he has showed me, and behold, the Lord was standing by a vertical wall with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, What do you see, Amos? And he said, A plumb line. And the Lord said, Behold, I am about to put a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel, and I will spare them no longer. We need to raise up the plumb line of God in our lives, of our children. We need to be standing by their side. You see, Jesus was standing by that vertical wall. We need to be standing by them, raising up this standard and holding it up to them and says, I'm not going to overlook I'm not going to spare you anymore the things of ungodliness and unrighteousness and wickedness because Ephesians 5.11 says this. It says, Do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them. And that's exactly what we're going to start doing this morning. Tomorrow we're going to be talking about the Internet, and there's a lot more detail in that, but today I want to start by talking to you a little bit about one of the biggest things and the biggest entrances to, the, to Satan in the life of your child, and that's their cell phone. The Nelson Group, averaged, um, at the average U.S. mobile teen is what they say. Average for them texting is around 3,000 messages per month. Now that's the average. They say that basically the highest, the, the, the range is between 10 and 12,000 for those who use the most. I personally have seen somebody in my family whose text messages reach 8,000. We need to be concerned because there are risks involved. We need to know what's going on in the lives of our children. So what are the risks? There's health and safety. There's inappropriate behavior, which the Bible calls foolishness. There's some things that we really need to be focusing in on, which are basically, it's called sexting, which is nude photos that they're sending to each other. There's something called bullying, which is basically harassment. These are some things we're going to be looking at today. So how do we protect our teens on their cell phones? I'm going to be sharing with you some advice, some tools, some tips, some techniques that you can provide. In your workbooks, there's three sites. There's three links that I've put there for you. These are the best sites you're going to find. And if you go to these three links, they're going to have some links you can go to. And from there, you can research for months and months and months on this subject. But the first thing I want to tell you to do as a parent is to set up an online account with your service provider. With an online account, you will be able to go and see the text times, the numbers that they're texting. Um, you won't be able to see the content. One helpful hint is you'll be able to sort by the times and the numbers. You will be able to see who has the most influence in your child's life. This may be a time that you set some friend-specific limitations. The second thing is set some time boundaries and limitations. I believe the first and most important after doing the study is that not while they're driving. I, I looked at some of these things, some of these statistics, it, it, it staggers me. In 2007, a study was conducted by AAA um, and was repeated in 17 magazines have been 46% of teens admit to texting while driving. CNET says that texting drivers focus their, focus, focus their time away from the road for an average of 4.6 seconds during a text. That is the time that it would take to travel the length of a football field at going 55 miles an hour. Car and Driver article just blew me away when I saw the title. It said this, texting and driving worse than drinking and driving. 
I read this article, and they talked about how they rigged a, a red light, a brake light on the, on the front of a car and put a professional driver in it who tested sober, he tested drunk, he texted while, he te they tested him while he was sending an email and while sending a text. And the results are scary. He was driving 70 miles per hour on a deserted, air, on a deserted airstrip. It said unimpaired. It took him 54 feet to brake. Drunk, it took him four more feet. Add four feet to that. Reading an email, it took, it, it took 36 feet, almost double. Sending a text, it took about 70 feet. It's scary. It's staggering. We need to make sure we set a standard, a boundary, a limitation that they're not texting while they're driving. If you want, there's in, there is a link to that site in your workbook. Also, I believe we need to set a limitation for church. I don't believe our kids should be texting during church. And there is a way for you to check that out, to follow up on them. I don't think there's anything wrong with them getting on their phones and looking at their Bible on phone or even writing their notes, as some kids do. But I believe we need to be, as parents, constantly checking up on them and make sure they're not texting during church. I think another boundary limitation we need to set is family times. Whether it's dinner, events, vacations. These are some of the things that I do in my own life with my own children. When we're at dinner, they don't pick up the phone and text. When we go on vacation, they're allowed to text while they're in the car on the way. When we get there, it's family time. In the evenings, I'll give them a texting time where they can get on and they can Facebook and they can talk to their friends. But I don't want that to be a distraction from what's important. The family that God has instituted and put it together. I believe there needs to be another boundary, which is their bedtime, their curfew. And that's one of those things that you're going to have to follow up, and it's going to take time, and it's going to take work as you go and you look online with your service provider and make sure they're abiding by these standards. Just one health and safety note. New York Times says the growing use of texting among teenagers is beginning to take its toll on some, phys on, on some physicians and psychologists are beginning to share their concerns. All the texting kids do creates anxiety, it keeps them from getting enough sleep, and it causes repetitive stress injuries. Set some boundaries. Check with your online service provider and make sure that they're honoring and respecting those boundaries. The third thing is, know who they're talking to. Ask them who they're talking to. You know, ask for their phone. I have a standard in my home that if I walk up to them and I stick my hand out, they're on their phone, they know they've got to place it in my hand with no argument, no disgruntled, no explanation, no nothing, and I can look at whatever I want. Ask them who they're talking to. Know who they're talking to. Check with your service provider. If you don't know them, you don't know the number, ask them who they are. If they don't know or you don't believe them, call it. Find out who they are. It's important to know what the competing influences are in your child's life. Don't give up. It's going to take work. The fourth thing is monitor their conversation. Now, I want to tell you right now, this is not invasion of their privacy. This is not invasion of their privacy. This is good parenting. I love what Brother Joe has to say about it. He calls it the FBI. It's the Family Bureau of Investigation. You know, in the beginning, this is what I've done, and I believe it's the best way to do this. In the beginning... Only you tell your child, only you are allowed to delete their messages. You scroll through and you read what's going on. You hold them accountable to what they're talking about. You know, I have, a same, I have an iPhone. I have the same standard for myself. I never delete a text message. It's big enough to hold every text that I've ever sent. My wife can get on my phone anytime she wants, and she can scroll through every single one of my text messages to anybody I've ever sent one to. I believe it's a standard we should hold ourselves to as adults. They're usually going to delete the message they don't want you to see. And that's where it's going to take time when you go online with your service provider and make sure that they're not deleting text. Remember, you can look in, in, in the, at the time and the number of texts. You can see where they're missing. You can, you can pretty much figure out the character of the friends that they're talking to about the messages they're having to delete. I'll tell you this, and it will occur... There's usually times of panic where they're going to erase all their messages and that's when the FBI needs to come out and find out what's going on in their lives. Have a set instruction and discipline what happens if when you stick your hand out they don't give you their phone. Speaking from experience again, there's going to be times where they're going to take their phone and they're going to run up the stairs and delete everything before they hand it over to you. You're going to have to have some wisdom in that moment. 
to what you're going to do and how you're going to defend them against what's going on in their lives. I believe later on, once they mature, once the trust level's built up, you can have a spot check. And again, have a predetermined discipline. With my daughter, who's a senior in high school, I walk up to her and I ask for a phone on occasion because I've built up an element of trust with her. She knows I've read every single one of her text messages in the past. And I walk up and I ask for her phone and she hands it to me and I look at her text messages and I hold her accountable for them. I did find the best tool I think um, I've ever found. It is in your workbook. It's called uh, Phone Spy. Um, it's made by Brickhouse Security. Um, basically what you do is you take your kid's SIM card out of their phone, you stick it into this USB device, you take the USB device, you plug it into your computer, and it'll tell you every one of their deleted texts that have not already been overwritten on the memory card of their SIM chip. I think this is a great device. My advice to you is if you would like a device like that, get with some other parents that want one and buy it together and keep it up here at the church or someplace convenient where you can go and on a regular basis look and see what's going on in the life of your child. It's cost of that $79. I believe your children are of high value and we shouldn't look at the price tag, but this is a great device that we can use to monitor and, and keep the enemy out of the lives of our children on their cell phones. Use the Word of God in this. Use truth. And when you're reading their, their text messages and you see something that's inappropriate, indiscretion, teach them with the truth. Teach them with the Word of God. You know, when they, you see examples of them giving counsel to friends that are hurting, tell them to pray for their friends. Tell them to tell them, I'm praying for you. Use it as a ministry tool. It's a great opportunity to teach them in their lives. But always give reasons for your discipline. Always give reasons. The more you do this, the more they will respect the limitation and the boundary. The more they will respect you as their parent. The fifth thing is be aware of social mapping. Be aware of social mapping. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but more and more cell phones have GPS technology. Um, teens who have these phones can pinpoint their friends' physical locations, and their friends can pinpoint them. Talk to your kids about not using this technology with friends that you don't trust, or not at all. I tell you what, guys, this really scares me. Because I was watching this YouTube video, and there's a link there in your, in your, uh, in your booklet that you'll be able to, uh, to look at, and it's, it's a real cute video about how uh, a girl is taking her boyfriend with her in her pocket, and she sticks her little phone in her bikini, and the, the, the boy can track her as well. But you and I know that these things don't last forever, these relationships, and it can turn into a stalking, it can turn into, they can pinpoint them, they can hurt them, they can harm them. Be very careful with this. However, this is a perfect tool for a parent. If you have an iPhone, you can go to iLoki2, which is I-L-O-C-I-2, in the App Store and get this on your phone and you can track your kids wherever they're at. If they have none iPhones, or it'll also work on the iPhone, there's a program called Instamapper. Um, there's a link to that in your book as well. You can track them from your computer anywhere they're at. Um, it'll show you, you can even track their speed and how fast they're going for all of you that have the speed demons in the group. If you don't have a compatible phone, there is a device and there's a link in your, in your book as well um, to a keychain that data logs every place they go and how long they spend there um, so that you in your own convenience can take that. It's a little USB device that goes on their keychain. You put it into your computer and it'll tell you everywhere they've been and how long they've stayed there at your convenience. That is a little pricey. It's $269, but there's a link there on how you can get that. I've also included a, a GPS location sharing tips for parents. Um, there's a link there so that you can do some more research on that as well to determine what your limitation and your boundary is going to be in that area. The next area I want you to be aware of is smartphones. Um, more and more people can access all of the things on the web. We're going to be talking about that tomorrow, so I'm not going to cover a lot of detail now, but I want you to understand that any filter you have at home is not going to stop them the content that they see on their phones. The best thing to do is make sure that they're not available to get web content on their phones. Uh, the seventh thing is be aware of social networking. Again, this is something that we're going to be talking about um, tomorrow in greater detail. Um, that's Facebook. Um, that's MySpace. That's these kind of things that we're going to be talking about, but I want you to understand they can also do this on their phones. And there is no kind of filter that you can place on there. Um, it's not the same as the surveillance you're going to be able to do on your own computer. So be aware that they're doing that. Be aware um, of that so that you can set your limitations and boundaries in that area as well. 
Um, the next thing is be aware of media sharing. All these, all these phones that we have today have cameras and they have videos on them. Teens love to share media with their friends, but there's both a personal reputation and safety aspect to this, um, as well as a legal responsibility and a legal aspect. Talk with your teens about never letting people photograph them in embarrassing or inappropriate situations, and vice versa. They need to understand their rights and they need to understand the privacy rights of others. Which leads us to the next thing, which is the biggest issue, the thing that we're going to cover the most here is in the area of sexting. Be aware and on alert of sexting. This refers to teens sharing nude photos via cell phones and the web too. This practice can be very serious legal consequences as well as psychological consequences. Pew Internet and America Life um, Project says that 4% of U.S. 12 to 17 have sent sex. 15% received one from someone they knew. MTV did their own survey with the TV network and the Associated Press and they said 29% of young people 14 to 24 um, have reported receiving messages with sexual images. I want you to tell you this, it's illegal. You need to tell them that don't take or send nude photos or suggested photos of yourself or anyone else. If you do, even if it's of you and you pass it along to someone else, you could be charged with producing and distributing child pornography. If you keep them, keep them on your phone or on your computer, you'll be charged with possession. If they go across state lines, which is very easy in the day and age we live in, people moving, keeping in contact, if this happens, it's a federal felony. If you get caught with any of these things and are charged with any of these things, you will be a registered sex offender for life. Your child will. There's a lot of parental tips that I have here. There's some links. Teen sexting tips for parents. They're in your book. Sexting primer for parents. MTV's Sexting in America provides stark warning for teens. That's a great article. And there's a video that goes along with it that you could show your kids. It's, they interview two kids whose their lives have been ruined because of sexting. One from doing it, from sending sex, and the other one from from uh, sending them to a guy and finding out all the things that go along with that. So it's a great material, great opportunity for you to share that with them. So be aware of that, but also the last thing is be aware of bullying. I believe that a lot of, you know, bullying is the same thing. When we were growing up, people, there were bullies who took care of us in school, right? Well, it's worse now that they have cell phones because they'll bully them on their cell phone and they'll make them do stuff they normally wouldn't do. I believe that most of the sexting takes place because a young man will, will tell a girl, just give me a picture of you in a swimsuit, no big deal. And she knows her parents wouldn't be happy with it. She knows that it's probably not right, but it's a little bit okay. It's accepted in, in the generation we live in. And she sends him the text or the sext. And then she, he says, I'm going to send this and show this to your parents if you don't send me something else. And it goes deeper and deeper and deeper says, if you don't send me something else, I'm going to post this all over the internet, which happens all the time, every day, every moment we breathe and live. These kind of things are going on. So don't believe your kid can't be a part of this sexting. Make sure that you are aware of all these things, that you set some limitations, you set some boundaries, which leads us to our fourth point that we were making, our 10 steps of training your child in a technological world. It sets some rules and limitations and boundaries for your child. Rules and limitations and boundaries are different. The rules need to be few and reasonable. Just like the rules that we have in the Word of God, we've got the Ten Commandments, but we've also got all of these precepts and principles that are based on those Ten Commandments. Make the rules few and reasonable. The, limit and, the limits and boundaries will constantly, as they grow older, change over time. Explain the boundaries. Explain the limitations and the reason for them. And then the one thing I want to suggest to you is establish the appeal process. This is one of the best things that I learned from Brother Joe, is to give your kids an opportunity. You hear them out. You pray about it. You give a decision with your reason. I believe that not every reason, not every decision requires a reason, but the more reason you offer, the more they're going to respect you, the more they're going to learn from you about the boundaries and limitations that are going to safeguard their life. Give them, offer them an appeal. When you say something and it immediately hurts your child, you made a rule or you set a limitation, you set a boundary, hear them out. Pray about it. And then make your final decision. 
Now, I want to discuss two fairy tales real quick, and it's not in your workbook, but uh, it's kind of fairy tales to avoid during this process. And the first one is this. Um, I can shelter my kid from foolishness. Proverbs 22, 15 says, Foolishness is bound up in the heart of the child, and the rod of discipline will remove it far from him. The misconception, don't be... <laughs> you need to stop the misconception that your child is influenced to foolishness by others in the youth group. You know, birds of a feather flock together. The, the Bible says it's bound up in the heart of the child. It's your responsibility to discipline them, to drive it far for, from them. Overprotecting your child can do more harm than good. Foolishness turns to rebellion against you and everything around you. Your children, I believe, I'm a firm believer, your children should experience more while they're at home, while you can instruct them, while you can teach them the error of their ways. Choose your battles, parents. If you shelter your child from outside influences, you're throwing them to the wolves when you send them off to college in the workplace. The greatest days of training are whether they're in your home. So they will not depart from it when they leave. The other misconception is be fair. Don't fall into the trap of fairness, parents. We want to be fair in our children's eyes. We want them to love and respect us. We want to be fair in their eyes. Be more concerned with being righteous in God's eyes. There's going to be a day, and I tell my kids all the time, there's going to be a day that I have to stand before God and be accountable for you. There's going to be a day you have to stand before God and be accountable for your children and your actions. Remind your children that God isn't fair. He's not fair. He does what's right. He does what's righteous. And people will not always see His righteousness as fair. Point them out to the workers in the vineyard to illustrate this point. Be aware of these fairy tales. The fifth thing is establish the person... Per, uh, excuse me. Establish the purpose of discipline. We, I believe that discipline is teaching biblical values and goals. Ephesians 6, 4 says, But bring them up in the discipline and what? Instruction of the Lord. Our discipline that we have for our children is to instruct them, to give them instruction so that they know the, the, the boundaries, and they know the limitations, and they know the commandment, they know the rule, they know why and how to apply it to their lives. It's not so that we can punish them for their bad behavior. It's so that we can instruct them, so that we can teach them, so that they will grow, so that they will learn to make the right decisions in their own mind, in their own lives, that they'll glorify God with their life, and they'll fulfill His purpose. The sixth thing, which leads right into, is give your children instruction. Be constant in your instruction. You know, the word constant, I looked it up in the dictionary, it's a fixed value. You're firm. You're constant. You're steadfast. Be consistent. It's not self-contradictory. You have to be consistent. If it's a rule for them, if it's a commandment, it's not a boundary or limitation. It's a rule, it's a boundary, it's a commandment for you. It's a commandment for all of your children. The rules and the limitations may be different for you. I mean, the limitations and the boundaries... For you or for an older child, but make sure they understand the difference between the rule and the, and the boundaries and, the, and uh, the limitations that you set. But be consistent across the board. Be clear. I looked that up. It says easily understood, free from confusion, uncertainty, and doubt. I know that it's very easy to tell our children because I said so. I do it all the time. But I do not believe that that's best parenting and instructing that we can do. I believe we need to give explanation. That they're, we're easily understood. That we're not confusing them. That they're not uncertain and they don't doubt us. Be clear. Be convincing, persuading, or assuring by evidence, appearing worthy of belief. You've got to persuade them. You've got to assure them with evidence. That's why I've given you all of these materials today so that you can assure them. So you can give them evidence for the boundary and the limitation they can see the results. Be consistent in your discipline. Kids come to me more often than not saying their parents are hypocrites, that they're frustrated because the rules are not clear, and the discipline is inconsistent. Think how frustrated that would make you on the job place. It would frustrate you to the point of giving up. Quitting. But in the home, there's no place for quitting. There's a young person who's defeated, and he has no hope in his home. 
That's when most youth turn to a lifestyle of rebellion when they lose hope. Believe it or not, your children value your discipline when it's clear and consistent. The seventh thing is give your children correction. I believe we need to make it real clear, consistent, and constant in that. We give them one warning. One warning. That means we're consistent. That means we're constant. We explain what's going to happen if they do it again. That makes us clear and convincing. We're instructing them. We're teaching them something. Then we follow through. And you know, that's where most parents fail right there. And that's what frustrates your kids more than anything else that you'll do in your instruction with your child. Is because when you don't follow through, you're teaching them that it's really not important. So they'll go out and do it again. And then you discipline them that next time, that next week. And they don't understand. They're confused. They're asking themselves, why did it not matter last week and it matters this week? We need to be more concerned with being righteous in our Father's eyes than we are about being the friend and being accepted in our children's. We need to give correction, but the last thing I want to put on this point of in number seven is to use praise as well as correction. You need to let them know when they meet and exceed or when they fail your expectations. And why? Let them know when you fail your own expectations. Relate to them the expectations that you have for yourself. Be open enough to share when you have failed these explanations, these expectations. Youth get frustrated and oftentimes give up when they can't do anything right or please or do anything pleasing to their parents. Make sure you use praise as well as correction. We'll continue with uh, step eight in our next session. I'll see you in just a few minutes.